In your 40 years of mediating conflicts between warring factions around the world, what's the most important thing that you do that creates peace between the people involved? First, I never hear what they think. See, uh, I get called a lot of names by people who hear what I'm saying. If, I think I see you've read my book. Uh, you probably can recall I was in a refugee camp in uh, Palestinian Authority and with all the crowd had to do was hear uh, from my interpreter that I was an American and a gentleman jumps up and screams at me a murderer and another one jumps up assassin and another one calls child killer uh, within an hour the guy that called me a murderer invites me to a Ramadan dinner at his house I didn't hear what he thought of me I connected to what he was feeling what he was needing as I walked into that refugee camp, there were hundreds of tear gas grenades all over the lawn, shot in the night before when they had a riot there. And on the side of the, each of the grenades was written, Made in USA. So when this guy calls me murderer, hearing that I'm an American, I tried to hear, what is the guy feeling? And I said, sir, are you furious? And then I tried to hear his needs. Are you needing a different kind of support from my country than you're getting? And he looks at me in a kind of a stunned way. Apparently, that's not the way people respond to him usually when he screams at them. He said, you're damn right. We don't have sewage. We don't have housing. Why are you sending these weapons? So I said, well, and that makes it clear why you'd be so aggravated. If you don't have these basics and you get these weapons sent over here, I can see that you, your needs are for some other kind of support. He said, do you know what it's like to live under these conditions for all these years? I said, so you'd like me to understand just how desperate it can be even for one day, let alone for many years. So I, I heard what was alive in the guy. Not what he thought I was, a murderer. I didn't say, I ain't killed anybody. I tried to hear what was going on in him. And when he trusted that I sincerely cared what he was feeling, what he was needing, he could start to hear me then when I said, look, uh, I'm frustrated right now because I came a long way to be here. I want to offer something. And I'm worried now that because you got me labeled as an American, you ain't going to listen to me. He said, what do you want to say to us? So he, he could hear me then. And we incidentally, we have a school there now, one of the schools that we call a nonviolent communication school in that refugee camp. And uh, whenever I go to that region, I'm well received hospitably in that refugee camp. Uh, but I had to see the human being behind uh, the, the names that he was calling me. Being called a name is not the same as being violently attacked by terrorists. Do you feel that there is uh, ever justification in using violence or aggression when responding to such an attack? Here, I would say no to violence or aggression, yes to the protective use of force. There are times when we need to use the protective use of force, but never violence and never punishment. The protective use of force is necessary when another person, for whatever reason, is not willing to communicate, and meanwhile, their actions are threatening our needs. So we need to take whatever action can be made to protect against that happening. But we can do that without violence. Uh, Gene Sharp's writings show how throughout history uh, people have defended against even armies and violent armies coming at them through the protective use of force. Um, I was walking down uh, the street, uh, a street in Paris about four years ago, a busy street, and I, a woman was walking next to me. All of a sudden, a man comes running up, spins her around, and hits her right in the face, and he starts for her again. Well, there wasn't time for me to talk with this man, so I used force to restrain him from doing that again. I didn't want to punish him. I didn't beat him. But I, I had sufficient force that I could keep him from continuing. So, yes, times you use force to prevent violence but not in the form of punishment to make people suffer because you have judged them as evil. But just talking to terrorists and the governments who harbor them doesn't seem to work either. Look at all the peace talks we've had and the violence just continues. Well, the kind of peace talks we have, I'm not very optimistic that they can prevent violence. 
They're not the kind of connections that get people connected with each other's humanness. They're basically uh, arguments and uh, that they try to find some compromise. Uh, we need to grow up and find out that there are far more powerful ways of having peace talks than the ones we now engage in. How would you engage these people in peace talks? Pretty much as I told you I did with the tribes uh, in Africa or when I've done... Uh, I was doing a, a little mediation between a group of Israelis and Palestinians in uh, Jerusalem. And I started that. I said, let's look at what your needs are that are not getting met. And a Mukhtar, who was a mayor of a village, he looked across at the Israelis and said, and said in a nice tone, does it bother you people to be acting like Nazis? And then a woman jumps up, an Israeli woman jumps up and immediately says, I should have known better than to come to this meeting. Uh, that was a totally un insensitive thing for you to say, Mukhtar. And she starts for the door. She's about to leave. Wait. We have hardly had two sentences, and people are already worse off than we began. So my role there was to help each connect at the need level. So I said to the Mukhtar, and I knew what he was reacting to. He was reacting to a law that enabled uh, the people to be put in prison for six months on suspicion. He was reacting to that. I said, Mukhtar, are you needing some understanding of how your need for safety isn't met with that law? He said, that's what I'm trying to say. Well, of course, he didn't say it exactly that way. And then I helped the woman to hear that. And then it was a different connection than when she's hearing that she's a Nazi. And uh, so that's what I do in those cases. I help people speak a language of life, which is closer to the truth, just what everybody needs, and stay away from this these enemy images that can easily sound like blame, criticism, attack. And unfortunately, most people aren't taught the language that I am suggesting, so I have to loan it to them when I do mediations at that level. Considering the amount of violence in the news, what do you say to those who describe your ideas as naive or utopian? I see a different world than the people probably do on the television and in the news. For example, I see the violence. I work in the places with the violence. But what they don't see are the people that I work with who have a different worldview, they have a different consciousness, and these people are spreading their consciousness rapidly. So these people are what give me the hope that they're not hard to find in every country. For example, Father Chris Rajendrana, priest in Sri Lanka, uh, he's doing incredible things there, using our training to get the, the both sides that have been at war to do reconciliation work. He has an orphanage of kids that have been orphaned by the war from both sides, and he's showing these kids now how to relate to each other in a different way. So in many countries now, I'm working in about 35 countries, and I see that kind of person every day in my work. So I see a different world than the people see on the television. I'm not naive. I see the, the suffering. I was in a refugee camp not long ago in... Uh, Sierra Leone, and uh, I was working with a, a French physician was accompanying me on this trip, and when the director of the refugee camp heard that she was a doctor, he said, would you come with me? There's this child that's uh, not very well, and I followed her over, and she was leaning over the child and the mother, and I said, Pascal, what's the matter? She said, the baby's dying of starvation. I said, why? She said, the mother's dying of starvation. And I turned to the refugee camp leader, and I said, well, why is this woman starving? He said, well, we lose, or why is this child starving? He said, we lose seven a day. You see? So I, I've seen this. I'm not naive. I know what's going on. I, I work in Rwanda. There are people that have had everybody in their family killed. So I know what can happen in this world. But I'm working with people all over the world that tells me it doesn't have to be that way. There's people who have survived all of that and never lost a consciousness that that isn't what our nature is. There's nothing we human beings like more than to contribute to one another's wealth.